Today I am really excited because in my hands I have the new Blackmagic Video Assist 4K. Yes, the external monitor slash recorder that was announced at NAB I have in my hands ready to unbox and I'm pretty excited because this thing looks awesome. Now I've used quite a few other external monitor slash recorders such as the Atomos Ninja Assassin, the Atomos Shogun, the video devices Pix E5, and all of them are great. They do exactly what they're supposed to do, but none of them have quite grabbed me like this one. And that's because of the price and some of the features I think could be better than those other monitor slash recorders. So we're gonna take a look and see if this thing is as awesome as I hope it is. Okay, let's crack this thing open. Now, this packaging is nice, I guess. You know, it's kind of the normal what you'd expect. Nice little welcome card, and there we have it. Inside this welcome card, we've got some software and manual and also DaVinci Resolve. That's really nice, actually, that DaVinci Resolve comes with this. I personally prefer speed grade because it fits in my workflow better, but DaVinci Resolve is great to have. So if you're looking for proper coloring, uh, you can definitely use that or speed grade, you know, whatever floats your boat. But um, that's kind of nice that they include that. I didn't realize that came with the monitor. It's good to have. Up here we've got these kind of little uh, other country plugs, if you will. Uh, depending on where you live, the other ones would be foreign to you. So whichever one is yours, that's the one you'll use. And we've got the video assist itself right here. Nice screen protector. Of course, that's coming off. We're not going to leave that on. And it feels very, very solid. One thing that I really like about the video assist is the fact that it has two SD card slots. Now that's important because a lot of the other external recorders, they use SSDs, which are great and fantastic and you can fit a lot of footage on them, but it's hardly ever that you would see something with two slots. Having SD card slots is really nice because you can hot swap between one and the other while you're recording which is a great feature to have. But one thing that's important to note about the SD card slots on the Video Assist 4K is that if you're doing 4K and you're recording ProRes or DNX HD, you will need the new UHS-2 cards. So there are specific SD cards that you will need to take advantage of the higher uh, write speed that you'll need for 4K with the ProRes files or DNX HD. They're not uh, extremely expensive, but they are more expensive than your standard SD cards. And it's kind of confusing because SD cards have so many different names uh, in terms of UHS-1, UHS-2, UHS-3. And now there's another UHS-2, it's the Roman numeral 2. And you'll actually see on the back of those SD cards, there are additional little chip spots. Uh, so it doesn't look like the back of a normal SD card, but you'll need those, and this takes advantage of those uh, with those slots. The other thing that's really nice about the video assist that uh, I'm seeing here, you've got both SDI and HDMI, which is incredibly valuable if you're doing uh, DSLR, mirrorless, hybrid cameras, you can use the HDMI, or you can have the SDI feature for your more higher-end cameras, like your... FS7s, your Reds, your Aries, etc. Uh, it's great to have both right in the same unit, especially for the price point. Most other recorders, not most, but some other recorders offer only one or the other, and now you don't even have to pick. And we've also got mini XLR inputs here on the side. I don't know that I'll be using those because I usually record uh, to an external recorder just for safety, but it's something that I guess I could start using. On the back, we've got two spots for hot swappable batteries. That's really nice. This takes LP6s, which are the Canon batteries. Pretty common, pretty cheap. You don't have to buy the official Canon batteries. You can find the other manufacturers that make them at uh, affordable prices. Just look online for the highly rated and reviewed batteries, and those should do you just fine. And that way you can get a bunch of them for a pretty low cost, and you'll have batteries for days. And this also takes power. Let's see if I can find the power input here. Uh, right here on the side, next to the SD cards, you've got 12 volt in. And what else do we have? We've got headphone and a power 
button it looks like. Is that a button? I don't know. It doesn't feel like a button. Oh yes, it is a button. It just, it, it clicks very specifically. It doesn't uh, jut out. So this button here is not uh, uh, easily clickable. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. It's not hard to click, it just doesn't click the way I would expect. And you can see quickly it's already getting smudged up by my fingers. It's a little hot in here so my hands are sweating. So I apologize for that, I'll have to clean it off after this. But we've also got quarter 20 mounts all the way around which is really nice to have. Uh, that way you can mount it in any configuration you want. Unfortunately there aren't any on the sides, but I imagine that's some kind of engineering uh, difficulty with all the other stuff they have on the slides. It's probably easier just to put those mounting points on the top and bottom. There is also a USB uh, port on the bottom. It looks like micro USB. I assume that's what that is. So maybe that's for firmware updates or whatnot, but I imagine you could probably also do that with SD cards. I don't know because I haven't done it yet. Uh, what do we have up here? Okay, so we've got some kind of buttons here. That looks like maybe battery releases? No, the battery should just pop off. I don't know what these buttons do up here, but that's what the instruction manual is for. We're gonna find out. What else? Oh, they did mention that this has a little kickstand built in. Let's see if I can get it out. I don't know how, oh, there it goes. So there's like a little flip stand so you can, I guess, set it. I feel like it would stand without that. I mean, it stands, it's a little bit more sturdy with this kickstand out, I guess. Yeah, that's a little bit better, but I don't know how often I would uh, even use that. Seems kind of like a gimmick, if anything. All right, what else do we have in the box? We've also just got the uh, power supply here. So this is where uh, we would plug in, let's see. This looks like the US plug here. So that snaps in fairly easy and you can just push it to, come on. You're supposed to just be able to push it to swap it. Not the easiest thing to do, but not difficult either. So that way you could swap to other outlet types. Probably never gonna have to do that, but hey, it's good to have the option in case you're traveling or you live somewhere else. They do give you quite a few options. So that is nice to see. And that looks like it's it. There's not much else in here. Let's see, is there anything under? Nope, nothing else. So we've just got the video assist itself and now we're ready to start shooting. Well, I just got the device set up and I recorded a few test clips. It's nothing I'm gonna show here, unfortunately, cause it's really not that interesting. Just my office and a few walls. I have more test clips to record, but first impressions are very good. It's very intuitive, very easy to set up and a little simple and kind of too straightforward. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but compared to some of the other external recorders out there, this doesn't have as many features. Namely being the biggest drawbacks in my mind currently is that there's no way to load LUTs onto the video assist just yet. I'm sure that's something that they're gonna implement in a future firmware upgrade. I hope they really need to have that as is the case right now. I'm actually recording with the video assist 4K in Vlog L with the GH4 and there's no way to monitor with a LUT on the screen currently. You can kind of jack up the contrast and jack up the saturation to make an equivalent, but it's really no comparison for a proper LUT. So I really want to see them implement that. And another thing I found out, speaking of which, being able to record on this, I'm actually recording to a normal SD card. Not normal, a fairly high speed one, but it's UHS-1, but I am doing 4K and I'm doing it at ProRes Proxy. Now, I wasn't able to get ProRes HQ or even ProRes working with this SD card, but I was able to get ProRes Lite and Proxy working with this SD card. Now, SD cards have various read and write speeds, so depending on what you have, it may or may not work, but it is nice to know that you might not have to fork over the money for UHS-2 cards just yet if you plan on recording light or proxy. 
And the nice thing about this is that it'll tell you if you're dropping frames. It'll keep recording, but it'll tell you and warn you that you're dropping frames, so you probably wanna switch cards or switch codecs that you're recording to. One thing I didn't like about this, and it's kind of a nitpicky thing, but the power plug, when I did the unboxing, I probably noticed it. It's kind of a big fat brick right at the end. I don't really like that so much. It's kind of hard to find a nice place to plug that in, especially on a power strip and even some outlets. It just bumps into other things. I really wish they'd put the brick in line on the cord, but again, that's kind of nitpicking. The other thing they need to implement on this is some kind of anamorphic viewing mode. You can do guides, which is really nice for uh, anamorphic, you know, if you're doing uh, cropping with black bars and stuff, but there's no proper way to view anamorphic stuff coming from actual anamorphic lenses or anamorphic adapters, which if you're familiar with the GH4, it has a 4x3 anamorphic mode, so it'd be really nice if I could put some anamorphic lenses on the GH4 and be able to monitor in anamorphic mode on the video assist. So again, I hope that comes with a firmware upgrade. Right now it's LUTs and the anamorphic viewing mode that I really want. But aside from that, everything else is really clean, really straightforward. Even like the fonts, the font that they used for the menu, I think is really nice. The touch screen is fantastic. It's really easy to just touch exactly where you want to go. Now, one thing about hardware that is good to keep in mind, these are the kind of things that can bug out, I guess. So we'll see. I'll do a follow-up if anything goes wrong. But right now, first impressions of the hardware is very, very good. Now, the screen has been going black every once in a while and I don't know what I don't know if that's my HDMI connection if it's the the recorder itself it's kind of worrying me a little bit but I'll have follow-up information about that once I'm able to review the footage it could just be the card that I'm using it's not saying that I'm dropping frames but I don't know I have to do a little bit more investigation to find out uh, one thing speaking of the screen so if you can see this I don't know if you can see this might be too bright but if you flip it it actually flips the display. It has some kind of accelerometer orientation inside to know which direction it's facing. So that's kind of cool. You can actually mount it upside down and have it view properly. Might make some problems for you at some point if you want it to be upside down, but uh, it's a nice feature to have. I didn't see anywhere in there to turn that off, so it might just be something that you're stuck with. Um, as far as the menus go, like I said, everything is super straightforward. You just touch what you want to modify and you go from there. The one thing I did f find kind of weird was there wasn't like a settings gear wheel on most uh, hardware and software systems now. There's usually like a little gear wheel that means settings. I, there's nothing like that. You have to go to the card slot, uh, go to the card, and then you have settings like your display, your audio, and your setup, like what the device is named etc. As far as the card goes, you can format it in the monitor as you'd expect, but you can actually format it to XFAT or HFS Plus. Um, I, I don't know if you have a specific need for one or the other, but it is cool that they give you the option to pick how you want to format the card. I really like that. It's kind of nice. Um, again, I'm recording HDMI, so I haven't tested the HDSDI inputs on here, but I imagine they work well. Uh, doing 4K, 24 frames a second. There's a histogram right on here, which is really nice. Again, nice feature to have. And there were some other features like zebras, which you can set anywhere uh, from 40%, 50, 60, 70, 80, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, and 100%. Can't go over 100%, you can just turn them off. You do have peaking, which I don't usually trust, but you can set it to low, medium, or high. Yeah, like I said, you've got guides for HDTV, 4x3, uh, 2.4 to 1, 2.39 to 1, 2.35 to 1, 1.85 to 1, and off. And there's also a grid that you can turn on or off for rule of thirds. All pretty straightforward stuff that you'd expect. There is a focus assist magnification feature. Uh, you can do that on the camera as well, but it is nice to have on the screen. Other than that, I don't think there's much else to say. I'm still recording. 
It hasn't dropped any frames, hasn't told me it's dropped any frames. So we'll see. And like I said, I was recording this Vlog L. I had to turn the lights on to get a little bit more ambient light in here for Vlog. It probably looks worse than the initial clip, but I wanted to at least show you guys something that was recorded with the external video, to, video assist 4K because, you know, like I said, uh, everything else I filmed was just my office walls. I still have to go out, do some actual shoots before maybe I'll trust it on a full-fledged production. But right now, I'm, I'm really liking it. I forgot to mention there are audio meters on here. Again, like you'd expect, but uh, it is something. Now, I don't know if there's necessarily a way, because right now, I don't know if you can see, the uh, menu, like the options for controlling everything. So it looks like the top of the frame is cut off at, you know, top of my head, but the bottom has the overlay. I don't know if there's a way. Oh, look at that. You can just hide it. Like I said, this thing is pretty intuitive. It doesn't take much to figure out. So once you get it and you start doing stuff, it usually works the way you want. Uh, the only thing that was weird was you had to go into the card to get those different settings. And then to get out of here, I couldn't figure out how to get out of this menu. And you actually just have to like swipe away. It took me a little bit to figure out, but there wasn't like a back or an exit. Maybe they should probably update the firmware just to make that a little more obvious. Um, but one thing I should mention finally as I wrap this up is that for the different codec formats, you have different record times, right? So ProRes HQ is going to take up more card space than ProRes, and ProRes Lite is going to take up less than that, and then ProRes Proxy is going to take up the least amount of space. With a 64 gig card in here, uh, ProRes Proxy was going to, it said an estimated about 48 minutes of record time with a 64 gig card. So that is a little bit... Um, how do I want to say this? It's a heavier codec in terms of file size than what the GH4 records internally, but that's the lowest ProRes setting you can have. So for a 64 gig card, 48 minutes. For ProRes Lite, I believe it was about half of that, so 22 minutes. And then ProRes, it was like 11 minutes or maybe 15 minutes, and then ProRes HQ is like 11 minutes. It, it, it shrinks pretty fast. So for a 64 gig card, you are going to go through footage rather quickly if you're recording ProRes HQ, which is going to give you the most information, it's going to give you the highest quality footage, but you may or may not need it depending on the project. So right now I am doing ProRes Proxy because again, this card couldn't handle the higher write speeds, but uh, with the UHS-2 cards that are coming, I will be able to do that and it'll just be uh, an option you know, whether I want to do the ProRes HQ stuff, if it's a project that really calls for it and we can afford to eat up the the hard drives and the file space with those big files, or if it's something where we cut it back and we say, okay, this one we're going to do ProRes Lite or ProRes Proxy or we're just going to do ProRes. It's really nice that there are a bunch of different flavors of ProRes in here so you can pick and choose what makes the most sense for your project. And again, you can always record internally on the camera that you're using if you're on the GH4 like I am right now in 10-bit mode, unfortunately you can't do that, but most other cameras you can record internally and externally at the same time. The GH4 you can in 8-bit mode, but right now I went 10-bit just so I could see how that all worked out. So just keep that in mind if you're expecting you know, a, a bunch of space to be able to capture all your footage and you're used to internal codecs and this is the first external recorder you're getting, just keep that in mind that you're probably going to need to invest and some hard drives, some extra SD cards, and a lot of time for copying those cards. It's not quite as quick and seamless, but you are getting 422 color, you are getting a higher quality codec, so there are pros and cons to each situation, and you just gotta figure out what makes the most sense in your situation. But I will leave it there. I'm really impressed, and you know, I keep saying finally, and like I'm, I act like I'm wrapping it up, but one thing I will say is it is kind of heavy. Um, I don't know how much it weighs. I'm sure that's a technical specification somewhere, but it does feel weighty. Uh, build construction uh, feels good, but maybe they'll come out with a smaller version that is a little bit more lightweight. This is a seven inch screen. The five inch screen right now only is the 1080p model. They'll probably update that in a year from now at NAB next year with a 4K version that's got a smaller screen. I like the screen. 
like I said, great touchscreen. Seven inches is good. It's definitely, again, more things to just say. Uh, the screen definitely has a different look to it than the camera screen. So I've got to take it into post-production to find out exactly what uh, it actually looks like, but the screen looks fairly different from what the camera is telling me. So I've got to look at that and see what that difference is actually, uh, actually is. For other external recorders, typically the HDMI looks slightly different than what the LCD shows, but it's usually pretty close. And even when you record internally and externally, there can be some small differences between the way the devices process the signal they're getting. So I do expect it to be a little different, but the screen is telling me that it's quite a bit different. But hopefully, they introduce firmware upgrades for this stuff so you can actually dial in your screen settings a little bit more than brightness, contrast, and saturation because as it is, it's a little limiting and if you're trying to match you know, what the camera is saying or you're trying to match another monitor, it probably would be nice to have those features. But that is it, I'm done talking. I've talked for far too long, but hopefully you found this valuable. Uh, if you're an Atomos, Ninja Assassin, Shogun uh, owner, or a video devices, Pix E5 recorder owner, or the Odyssey 7Q, or any of the other recorders out there, you're probably fine and probably happy with what you have. But if you're looking for an external monitor slash recorder, I would highly recommend currently, based on... Actually, I can't say I highly recommend it. Based on initial impressions, things are good. Uh, cautiously, maybe buy one, test out for yourself. Maybe rent one if that is an option and see if it's something that'll work for you. But the price point is definitely right. The fact that it records to SD cards is great. The battery option of having two separate batteries that you can hot swap, two separate SD cards. There's a lot of things to like about this. And I think the only problems that I'm currently having with it can be fixed with firmware upgrade. So hopefully Blackmagic will see this video or just know that they have some work to do and get those firmware upgrades out faster than slower. Who's to say with that company, the speed they do things? I don't know. And with LUTs and anamorphic monitoring, I would be happy.